Number 1. Frawley was last known to be at or near her apartment at the Copperfield Apartment Complex in the 1800 block of Lowell Bethesda Road in Gastonia, North Carolina, on April 8, 2008. She was suffering from stomach flu and had been to the hospital twice the previous day. She called her mother at around midnight and said she was sick again. At 1.30 a.m., Frawley called a friend and said someone was going to pick her up and take her back to the hospital. She has never been heard from again. Frawley left her purse, wallet, keys and identification behind at her residence. Two days after her disappearance, a utilities worker found her cellular phone at the intersection of South New Hope Road and East Hudson Boulevard, three miles from her home. Several phone calls were made from the phone at 4.30 a.m. the day she disappeared. None of the calls turned out to be connected to her disappearance, they were apparently from the phone's list of recent calls dialed. The phone also received a call early on the morning of April 9. Police stated that by the time they took possession of the phone, it had been handled by too many people to be valuable as evidence. Frawley was engaged to be married at the time of her disappearance. Her fiancé's father, Ricky Dale Simmons Sr., is considered a person of interest in her case. A photograph of Simmons is posted with this case summary. He did maintenance work at the Copperfield complex, he lived two apartments over from her and was one of the last people to see her, he gave her a ride to the hospital emergency room a few hours before her disappearance and another neighbor drove her home. Simmons refused to take a lie detector test in Frawley's case. He has a criminal record for fraud, larceny and drug charges, and he served time in prison in the 1980s for manslaughter in connection with the strangulation death of an ex-girlfriend. In June 2008, another ex-girlfriend found Simmons' body in the trunk of her car. The woman had filed a restraining order against him after her car was broken into and her purse and keys were stolen. When she found the body, her keys were in Simmons' pocket and her purse was in the trunk with him. Authorities believe he hid inside the car trunk in order to ambush his ex-girlfriend and he got trapped there and died of heat stroke. It was only after his death that police said they suspected him of involvement in Frawley's disappearance. There is no proof that he harmed her, however. A convicted murderer named Jerry Douglas Case confessed to Frawley's murder in 2015. Case killed a 17-year-old boy in 1985, his death was originally ruled an accident, and Case wasn't suspected until he wrote a letter to the Gaston Gazette in 2012, confessing to the crime. He was, at the time, serving a 22-year prison sentence for killing another individual. He was convicted of second-degree murder in 2015. Later that year, he wrote another letter to the Gaston Gazette and confessed to having killed Frawley and another Gaston woman who was shot to death in 2008. However, he was incarcerated when Frawley disappeared and police don't believe the confessions are credible. Frawley was a part-time student at Gaston College at the time of her disappearance, she had never used illegal drugs, but she wanted to become a drug counselor to help others. Investigators don't believe she left of her own accord, as she had no driver's license and no transportation, and it's uncharacteristic of her to leave without warning. Her fiancé was incarcerated at the time of her disappearance and therefore isn't considered a suspect. Little evidence is available in her case, which remains unsolved. Number 2 Henry was last seen with his wife, Christy Wilson, in Monterey, Tennessee at 8 p.m. on May 9, 2018. Henry picked his wife up from her aunt's house at 8 p.m. later that night, they stopped at Tom's Market to buy cigarettes. This is the last time anyone is known to have seen them. They were driving a charcoal gray 2001 Nissan Sentra, which had sun damage paint, damage to the red bumper, bad tires, and the Tennessee license plate number 310 DVD. Neither of them has ever been heard from again. The morning after the Wilsons were last seen, Henry's cellular phone pinged off a tower in Fentress County. Christie's phone pinged later in Overton County, in the Coy Phillips Road area. An extensive search turned up no sign of them. Police stated that although their marriage had been troubled, there was no evidence that one of them had harmed the other. In September 2018, their car was found at the bottom of a ravine off Hanging Limb Highway in Overton County, Tennessee. It had been there so long that there were plants growing in it. There was no sign of Christie or Henry, however. Christie's family stated the couple was poor, Christie was collecting disability benefits, and Henry was a day laborer. Although he had a drug problem, his daughter described him as a great dad, and neither of them had ever gone more than a few days without contact with their families. Christie left a disability check behind in the mailbox at her home. Her family stated she was planning on returning to work soon. The Wilsons' families hired a private detective after their disappearance, and the detective believes the couple was killed in a drug deal gone bad. 
Henry supposedly got into a fight with a suspect over a drug deal and was shot by the suspect, and a second person shot Christy after she started screaming. This has not been proven. No suspects have been named in Henry and Christie's disappearances, but foul play is suspected in their cases. Number 3 Kelly was last seen at approximately 8.30 p.m. in Gilmer, Texas on January 5, 1992. She was leaving her place of employment, Northeast Texas Video on Buffalo Street, and heading to the bank around the corner to make her usual night deposit. The bank's security cameras showed that an individual did make the night deposit, but it is unclear whether or not the person was Kelly. She has never been heard from again. Kelly's car was discovered later in the evening in her employer's parking lot. One of the vehicle's tires had been slashed. The other three tires were intact. All of Kelly's personal belongings, including her purse, were inside the car, but her keys were missing. A grand jury indicted Gilmer Police Department Sergeant James York Brown and seven others on charges of Kelly's abduction and presumed murder in January 1994, two years after Kelly disappeared. Prosecutors believed that Brown, who had been assigned to investigate Kelly's case, was involved with the seven other individuals with kidnapping and imprisoning Kelly for over one week. The state also contended that they sexually assaulted and tortured Kelly while she was held captive, then stabbed her to death. It was alleged that the group was part of a satanic cult and engaged in violent acts, including child molestation, as part of their cult rituals. Many of the defendants charged with Kelly's murder were also charged with sexually abusing children. The murder charges against everyone were later dropped two months after the initial allegations had been made. One suspect, a teenager named Michael Bybee, was convicted of a misdemeanor for slashing Kelly's car tire. He admitted to the crime, but maintains he knows nothing about Kelly's disappearance and was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. The satanic cult was found to be non-existent, a fantasy concocted by overzealous investigators. Brown and the other defendants maintained their innocence in Kelly's case from the onset of the investigation. Kelly was dating Chris Denton at the time of her disappearance. He reportedly had a hot temper, and police investigated him for possible involvement in her case, but found no evidence to implicate him. He died of cancer in 2004, and there were rumors he had made a deathbed confession regarding her case, but the stories were untrue, Denton maintained his innocence until the end. Joe David Henry, the owner of Northeast Texas Video and the last person to see Kelly before she vanished, was arrested on child pornography charges in 2004. Authorities have emphasized that in spite of the nature of the charges against him, he has never been considered a serious suspect in Kelly's case. Kelly was a student at Gilmer High School in 1992. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Foul play is suspected. Number 4 Maureen's husband of 15 years, Paul Fields, says he last saw her at 8 a.m. on February 15, 2006, at their home in Parump, Nevada. The couple had an argument just before Maureen left for her job at the Parump Valley branch of the Wells Fargo Bank, where she had worked as a teller for the past three months. Maureen didn't arrive at work by 8.30 a.m. as scheduled, and after waiting 20 minutes, her co-workers called Paul. He said he thought she had left for work. After getting off the phone he went directly to the police station. Paul later claimed he attempted to report Maureen as a missing person at this time, but the police wouldn't accept a report because she hadn't been gone for 24 hours. The police said, however, that when Paul did visited the station, he said nothing about a missing person and only asked if there had been any accidents involving a green Hyundai. A photo of Paul is posted with this case summary. On February 16, Maureen's green 2004 Hyundai was found in Inyo County, California, about 12 miles from the Nevada state line. It had been stuck in the sand in a desert area about 125 feet off the road. Her keys were in the ignition, the driver's seat was fully reclined, and slippers and eyeglasses were under the gas pedal. Some religious pamphlets were fanned out next to her purse, which contained her credit cards and wallet. A knotted pair of pantyhose was also present, as were bottles of prescription painkillers and tranquilizers, at least one of them empty. On the ground nearby was a blanket stained with a small amount of blood and vomit. There was no sign of Maureen at the scene. Authorities initially believed Maureen wandered off into the desert and committed suicide. An extensive search of the area turned up no sign of her, however, and no suicide note was recovered. DNA from an unidentified male was subsequently discovered on items at the site of the abandoned car. Investigators stated they believed the scene had been staged by whoever was responsible for Maureen's disappearance. Authorities believe foul play was involved in Maureen's case, and for years they focused on Paul as their prime and only suspect. 
Maureen's family claims the marriage was very troubled and she wanted a divorce. One of Maureen's friends described Paul as a jealous, domineering husband and stated Maureen was afraid he would kill her. She told many people she was afraid of Paul, but she denied any physical abuse. The day before her disappearance, Valentine's Day, she was extremely upset at work and told co-workers, something's going to happen. Paul maintains his innocence in his wife's disappearance. He stated that, just before she left the house the day she vanished, Maureen said, I might as well do it now. Why wait? He also claimed Maureen had been draining thousands of dollars from their joint accounts prior to her disappearance, and he believed she had a gambling problem, as well as a problem with prescription drugs. She normally handled the couple's finances, but after Paul found out about the missing money he told her he was going to start checking their bank and credit card statements from now on. Paul said Maureen took two $7,000 cash advances off their credit cards prior to her disappearance and withdrew $2,000 from their joint bank account. He theorized she staged a suicide and ran away, rather than face up to what she had done. He also said he had evidence that Maureen had asked a third party to kill him prior to her disappearance, an allegation police do not believe. Police checked into the couple's finances after Maureen disappeared and said Paul's statements were inaccurate and his wife only took one $4,000 cash advance off a credit card. She used the money to pay off another card. Paul allowed the police to search his house and property several times. He initially consented to a polygraph, but later reneged on the advice of his attorney. He has stopped cooperating with police in Maureen's disappearance. After waiting the required 90-day period following Maureen's disappearance, he went to court to get her name taken off their jointly owned land, claiming abandonment. In an effort to keep Paul from getting her assets, Maureen's father attempted to become her legal guardian. In response, Paul dropped his claims that Maureen abandoned her property and changed her status to a missing person. While she was legally missing, he could not divorce her. He had her declared legally dead in 2009 and was named executor of her estate. The investigation went in an entirely different direction in the fall of 2012, when DNA from another man was found on the knotted pantyhose left near Maureen's car. A photo of the person, Keith Wayne Holmes, is posted with this case summary. He was in his mid-70s at the time of Maureen's disappearance and a registered sex offender with two prior convictions for child molestation. He was arrested in June 2011 for trying to lure a 12-year-old girl into his car. At the time of his arrest, he lived in Per Blossom, California, over 200 miles from Parham. Investigators know he was in the Parham area in 2006, however. Holmes died in a prison hospice in April 2014. He claimed he'd met Maureen and they had consensual sex, and he left her alive in Death Valley. He also stated he knew Paul, but he didn't provide any further information about Maureen's disappearance. He was questioned repeatedly by the police in his final days, but he had dementia and was often not lucid. Authorities stated finding Holmes DNA didn't mean rule her husband out as a suspect. Maureen graduated North Arlington High School in New Jersey in 1983. Her loved ones stated she was very particular about her appearance, she had cosmetic nose surgery and liposuction, she never wore jeans or t-shirts in public, and she never left the house without makeup. Maureen left behind her eyeglasses, contact lenses, prescription medicine, shoes, and her cherished pet pit bulldog. Her loved ones don't believe she would have left of her own accord, especially without her pet. Her case remains unsolved. Number 5 Diane lived with her parents and siblings in San Bernardino, California until 1959. In March of that year, her family moved to Dolan Springs, Arizona. Diane decided to remain in California with her boyfriend, Benny Milton Webb, who was then 16 years old. She visited her family in Arizona on at least one occasion and stayed for a week. She told her parents she was pregnant and was going to marry Benny, who was then in the Phoenix, Arizona area. Diane's father disapproved of the relationship and her pregnancy, but her mother and younger brother traveled to Indio, California to attend her wedding. This was the last time her parents and siblings actually saw her. For several months after her marriage, Diane wrote letters home. The last letter to her family was mailed on August 22, 1959, her younger sister's birthday, and included some handkerchiefs Diane had crocheted as a gift. After this, the letters stopped coming. Sometime in late 1960, over a year later, Benny wrote a letter to Diane's family. The letter indicated he thought she was with them in Dolan Springs, and Diane's parents wrote back to Benny, asking what had happened. Benny replied on January 5, 1961, and said he hadn't seen or heard from Diane in a very long time. The last time he saw her, 
he had given her $100 and put her on a bus to come back to her family. Diane wrote him one letter after he last saw her and said she had had a miscarriage. Benny suggested Diane's parents contact a female friend of hers in California, he thought her friend might have information as to her whereabouts. Sometime after Diane disappeared, her father went to Benny's hometown of Truth or Consequences, New Mexico to see if he could learn anything about her. Benny's brother was chief of police at the time. He allegedly threatened Diane's father and made him leave town. Benny is still alive, but he has refused to cooperate with the police or take a polygraph and says he doesn't recall ever marrying to Diane. A copy of their marriage certificate is still extant, however. In August 1961, Diane or someone using her name visited a dentist's office in California. This is the last sign of her. The skeletal remains of a young girl were found in the Catalina Mountains in southern Arizona in November 1967, and investigators initially believed they were Diane's and tried to give them to her family. The death was ruled a suicide. Diane's mother did not believe her daughter would have taken her own life or that the remains were hers, and she and her husband refused to accept them. In 2013, the bones were exhumed and tested for DNA, they were not Diane's. Diane's parents have died, but her siblings continue to search for her. Her case remains unsolved. Number 6 Daphne was last seen in Oakland, California on July 10, 2013. Her father, John Anthony Webb, called 911 at 11.05 a.m. and said she'd been kidnapped out of his black 2002 Ford Expedition SUV which was parked in front of Ghazali's supermarket in the 1400 block of 79th Avenue. He stated she was taken from the right rear passenger seat. Photos of Anthony and his vehicle are posted with this case summary. He said he went into the supermarket to buy a drink, leaving Daphne in the car with his 87-year-old mother, who suffers from dementia. When Anthony returned, Daphne was gone. Authorities initially treated Daphne's case as a non-family abduction and described a possible suspect as an African-American or Hispanic woman in her 30s who had long, straight black hair and wore a light-colored shirt and blue jeans. Witnesses saw this woman walking away from the vicinity carrying a girl matching Daphne's description, but no one actually saw anyone take Daphne from the vehicle. An extensive search of the area turned up no sign of the child or the suspect. Daphne lived with her father and grandmother in the 800 block of Greenridge Drive, off Keller Avenue, at the time of her disappearance, her mother lived elsewhere. Her mother was located, questioned and ruled out as a suspect. Later on the day Daphne was reported missing, Anthony was arrested for felony child endangerment for leaving her in the car with his disabled mother. The district attorney declined to press charges against him, however, and he was released after two days in custody. In May 2014, 10 months after his daughter's disappearance, Anthony committed suicide at the home he'd shared with her. He took an overdose of prescription medication and didn't leave a note or any other explanation for his actions. Authorities view Daphne's father as a person of interest in her disappearance, but even before his death the investigation into her case was stymied by lack of evidence. Investigators believe Daphne may be deceased. Her case remains unsolved. Number 7. Fleischman was last seen at the Buckhead Saloon in Uptown Charlotte, North Carolina on November 9, 2007. He had gone there with friends after attending a show, then he became separated from the group and his friends went home. The bar's surveillance cameras show that Fleischman left alone at 2.20 a.m. and got into a cab at Tryon Street. He kept making cellular phone calls after he left the bar and phone records indicate he was still in the Uptown area during this time. According to Fleischmann's father, he was seen outside the Fuel Pizza restaurant down the block after he left the saloon, and his image was captured on surveillance tapes. An employee there remembers Fleischmann coming inside the restaurant at 2.30 a.m. He was alone and ordered two slices of pizza. The employee didn't see him leave. A cab driver thinks he saw a man fitting Fleischmann's description walking on North Davidson Street at 3.25 a.m., but he couldn't say for sure whether the man he saw was Fleischmann. The last time Fleischmann used his cellular phone was at 3.30 a.m. when he called his roommate and his sister. They didn't answer and he didn't leave any messages. Since then, his cellular phone has been turned off and there has not been any activity on his bank accounts. He left his debit card and his coat at the bar and left his car parked at a friend's home, but he is believed to have been carrying his black leather wallet, his car keys and approximately $6 in cash. He was reported missing the next day when he did not show up for work at Fidelity Investments, an investment firm where he was an executive. He lived in a condominium with roommates, none of whom are considered suspects in his disappearance. 
Fleischmann is described as a responsible man, and it's extremely uncharacteristic of him to leave without warning. At the time of his disappearance, his mother was undergoing treatment for breast cancer, and he kept in close touch with her as a result. He wasn't having any personal or financial problems and appeared to be in good spirits the day he went missing. Fleischmann is a 2006 graduate of Elon University, where he majored in business administration and was a member of the Kappa Alpha fraternity. His case remains unsolved. His parents believe he was probably murdered.